Happy Snow Day, everyone. Lest you think your 313 instructors have forgotten about you, we have not. We're busy at work making sure that we get you all the information you need. First, a few reminders. If you've not yet begun assignment one, now would be a really good time to do so. And in fact, we are releasing the tutorial that we were going to cover today, and so you can work through that as well. Don't forget, quiz two, I'm sorry, quiz one will be released on Friday and then due Monday. And I also want to say that the next part of the implementation that I'm going to talk about is covered really nicely in the book. And so I think either reading or skimming it would be greatly encouraged. For students who like my office hours, I'm switching them from Monday after class to Wednesday after class starting next week. So I look forward to seeing lots of you come visit me next week. When we last left off in my section, at least, we had done sort of an artist's rendition of what an implementation might look like. You folks had struggled with it a little bit, and then I kind of scribbled some lines to show you some of the connections between the different parts of the computer. What I'm going to do in the rest of this presentation is dive into this in a more official and more precise manner. So one of the things I wanted to point out is that we can think of even this picture as being broken down into three crude phases. In one, you're fetching the instruction, sort of getting ready to execute. In the next, you're decoding it, figuring out kind of the details of what you're going to do. And then finally, you go ahead and execute it. So we'll talk about the implementation in those three phases, and then we'll actually augment it and get a little bit more detailed. Let's begin with fetch. At a conceptual level, what do we have to do during the fetch phase of execution? Well, the first thing we need to do is actually go get an instruction from memory. And then we need to break that instruction apart into the various fields that comprise that instruction. So what parts of the processor should we think about as being involved in the fetch phase? I would claim that we certainly need the program counter because that's going to tell us where the next instruction is. We need the memory because that's actually where the instruction lives. And we need some logic to compute the next value of the PC. Because our instructions have variable lengths, we actually need to know what kind of instruction it is before we know where to advance the PC. So here are the pieces that we need to implement the fetch part of our instruction operation. We've got real program state, the memory and program counter, our state that reside in your processor. We've got logic that is going to compute how to increment the program counter. And then we have an internal register where we're going to store the instruction that we're operating on. Now throughout these slides, I'm going to try to be consistent in color coding and shape coding these different kinds of things. So the blue boxes are processor state. The curled paler blue boxes are um, logic. And then these really pale bubbles I'm going to use to represent internal state. Now I want to take a moment to talk about memory. Because if you look at the book, and you'll hear people refer perhaps to the data memory and the instruction memory. Now the reason we do this is that most processors today are built with what's called a Harvard architecture where you have different buses or connections to access memory for instructions and to access memory for data. However, at the end of the day, your main memory is one big chunk. And as you look at the programs that we put in the simulator, you see that there's really just a chunk of memory and different parts contain instructions and different parts contain data. So there really is only one bank of memory, but we access it in different places and at different times to get instructions and to get data. When we start talking about caches in module three, you'll see that we actually realize a distinction between instructions and data in that caching architecture. But for now, conceptually, you can think of memory as one big chunk, but we're able to access it both with one bus that reads instructions and another bus that reads data values. Let's now peer inside that instruction. We're going to want to tear apart the instruction 
into all its different fields. So you might remember that every instruction has one nibble, four bits that represent the actual opcode, another four bits that sometimes represent a particular function within that opcode. Think about the conditional jump instructions or the conditional move instructions or even the arithmetic and logical operations. Then we may have two register specifiers, which we call RA and RB. And then sometimes we have an eight byte quad word value stored in the instruction. We'll call that valc. When we put this together, we get the entire fetch sequence of sending the program counter to memory as an address. The memory returns the instruction at that address, gets broken up into all its parts in the registers, and finally, we increment the PC once we know the size of the instruction. Let's look at how this works for the NOOP instruction. The opcode for NOOP is 1, so that value will get written into I code. The function value is 0, that goes into I fun. The other three registers get their default values, F for RA and RB and 0 for val C. And because this is a single byte instruction, we increment the program pointer by 1. Now it's your turn. Here are three instructions. And what I want you to do is pause the video, map each of these instructions into their encodings, just like we did for NOOP, and then make sure you know how those encodings map into the internal registers. I'll then walk you through the answers, but I really want you to stop the video and give this a try first. Let's consider the instruction add q r8 to r9. The opcode for an ALU operation is 6. The function value for an add is 0. And in this case, ra is 8 and ra is 9. So that would be how we encode the instruction and how those encodings map to our internal registers. There is no val c, so we'll default that to 0. And how big is this instruction? It's 2 bytes. So we expect the program counter to upgrade by 2 bytes. Let's look at the next example. This is a conditional jump to the address COCO. Well, what's the opcode of a jump instruction? That's a 7. What's the function when we're doing a jump conditionally on whether it's equal? Well, that happens to be a 3. Oh, by the way, there's a cheat sheet with all this information at the end of the slide deck that you can access from the Canvas site. We now take COCO, we write that into the rest of the instruction. Remember, we use a little endian encoding. And we have no registers, so they get the default values. And finally, val p is going to be incremented by 9, because it's a 9-byte instruction. Finally, let's take a look at our most complicated example. This is a move from memory into a register. Let's begin by looking at the encoding. The opcode for this instruction is a 5, and the function is a 0. Now, this is the part that gets a little bit tricky. Normally, we think of the destination register as being an RB. But in this instruction, even though R9 is a destination register, it goes in RA. And the reason is that we're always going to do address calculation off of RB. And in this case, the register that we're doing address calculation on is the stack pointer, which happens to be register 4. So that's going to go into RB. And then the offset that we're adding to the contents of RSP goes into the val C field. Now, we put the val C value into the register. And this is a 10 byte instruction. So when we update the PC, we're going to update the PC by 10. Make sure you understand that encoding of the registers RA and RB, because in some ways it's a very non-traditional encoding. And ideally, as we get to the execution phase, you'll start to see why the encoding looks like it does. The decode phase for Y86 is actually quite simple. We have a register file, and we've already taken out the parts of the instruction that define RA and RB, and we simply feed those into the register file and say, please read those registers 
and take the results and put those in source A and source B. So after decode, source A and source B contain the contents of the registers in question. The execute phase is by far the most complicated of the phases we've talked about so far. And in fact, we'll see by the end of this presentation that we're going to break up that execute phase into multiple smaller phases. Let's begin by focusing on the ALU. The ALU is actually a logic block. It implements things like addition, subtraction, multiplication, but it's kind of a beefy logic block that we think of as a main part of the processor. So as a result, I've used the rounded box to indicate that it's logic, but it's a slightly different color and looks more like our program state to sort of give you that feeling that it's a little bit of both. So we all know that one of the things the ALU does is it updates condition codes. So the condition codes are real state in the processor, and at least one of the outputs of the ALU is going to go to the condition codes. Now you might wonder why I don't have source A and source B hooked directly up to the ALU. And the reason is that sometimes we're going to feed different values other than the ones out of the registers into the ALU. So what I want to do is I want to introduce some logic blocks, which I'll call val A and val B, which take the outputs from the register file. They're going to make some decisions, and then they'll feed those inputs into the ALU. If that sounds a little vague, just be patient. In the next couple of instructions, I think it'll all become clear. What happens to the output of the ALU? We're going to call the output signal val E, and in most cases, it's going to go directly back into the register file. So you can think of your canonical add R8 to R9. R8 and R9 get read out of the register file. We compute in the ALU. We take the result back, and we feed it back into the register file. Once again, I'm going to ask you to pause the video and think about how you would take that structure that we've developed so far and use it to implement a seemingly simple register to register move instruction. After you've thought about it for a while, then start the video back up. But you'll really get more out of it if you do pause the video and think hard about this. I bet you were tempted to implement register to register move by creating a special path from source A back into the register file to get written into source B. While one could implement it that way, adding extra data paths where big quad values have to move around a chip is actually quite expensive. So in reality, the way we do this is instead, remember how I told you we were going to use these logic blocks of val A and val B to allow us to select different values to feed into the ALU? Well, that's exactly what we're going to do. We're going to allow val B to select from either what came out of the register file or from the constant 0. So we can take source A, we can add 0 to it, which doesn't change it, and then the ALU will produce exactly the right result to write back into the register file. And the only thing we have to add is a tiny little bit of control logic from the I code that tells val B on any particular instruction which of the inputs should it select. Should it select the one from the register or should it select the zero? In the case of register to register move, it's going to select that zero. Once again, I'm going to ask you to stop the video and think about how you would reuse all the machinery we've built so far to implement the move immediate into a register. OK, let's figure out which mechanism that we've built we can reuse. We know that if we can feed an operation through the ALU, we can write it back to the register file. Further, we know that we can feed a 0 into val B. So all we need to do is take the value from the instruction, that is val C, and allow it to go through val A. Now we can take that immediate value, add 0 to it, type it through the ALU, and write it back to the register file. The only additional piece we need is the control signal telling us which value to select for val A. Finally, I'm going to ask you to sit down and think about how to do memory to register and register to memory moves. Warning, these are a bit trickier than the prior operations. 
but I want you to think carefully about how to reuse some of the structure that we've already built. In particular, think first about how to construct the addresses that we're going to need to use to access memory. Moving data to and from memory is a bit trickier than the other operations because there are fundamentally two things we have to do. We have to compute an address, and then we have to do the read or write to or from memory. Let's focus first on how we compute the address. Recall that in address, we take the contents of a register and we add it to the immediate value in the instruction. Fortunately, we've already created a path from val c, that immediate value, into val a, which goes into the ALU. So if we want to add the immediate value to the contents of a register, we're all set up to do that. The immediate value goes through val a, and the register goes through val b. What this means is that we can use the ALU to produce the address. All we need to do is add a wire that says, oh, sometimes that value is used as an address to access memory. Great. So now we've computed the address. Let's imagine that we're going from memory into the register file. Well, that suggests that we take the data that we read out of memory and we feed it directly to the register file. Conversely, if we're going from a register to memory, then what we'll do is we'll take the value that was in the register, notice that's the A register because we used B for address calculation, and we'll take that value and that's what we'll write to memory. Now at that instant, you should notice a problem. We need to use val A to mean two different things. In one case, we want the immediate value of val A to go into the ALU, and in another case, we want the value out of the register to get written into memory. In other words, we're trying to do two things at once, and that doesn't really work. So we're going to leave off here for today, and then Friday, we're going to look at how we break up this execution phase so that A, we're not trying to do too much in any one phase, and B, we resolve this particular problem.